Hi, welcome to the screencast for 12.3. 12.3 starts looking more at properties of liquids and solids compared to that of gases. So kinetic molecular theory still applies, but now the space between the particles isn't nearly as big. In fact, liquids are fairly close to each other. They still have particle motion with constant collisions and elastic collisions, and their energy is still dependent on their mass and their volume. But liquids are just like uh, gases slowed down quite a bit and in a much more contained space. So liquid particles still have, a tr uh, have much greater attractive forces than gases, but they still have random motion. But liquids are close enough together that the attractive forces do affect it, so that keeps a constant volume. But it's not so great, the attractive force isn't so great that it holds a constant shape. So that's why when you pour water into a glass, the volume remains the same, unless it's there for like a long time and some of it evaporates, but generally the volume remains constant. And the shape remains constant as long as it's in the glass, but if the glass gets tipped over, now that water spills all over and it takes on a new shape depending upon what it spills on. Density is going to be greater in liquids than it is in gases and compression is going to be much less because liquid particles are already fairly close. There isn't nearly as much space between liquid particles as there is between gas particles. Liquids are also what we call less fluid. Fluid is the ability of a substance to flow or move and so liquids are less fluid than gases because they diffuse much slower. When you put a drop of food coloring in a container of water, it eventually will diffuse and spread throughout that container, but it does it much slower than when you spray something at the front of the room and you very quickly smell it throughout the room. That's because of their density. There's a lot more particles they're gonna bump into as they try to find their way throughout the corner. So both liquids and uh, gases are considered fluids. However, a lot of us think of fluids and liquids as the same thing, which is true, but don't forget it also includes gases. We don't think of gases as being fluids because we generally don't notice gases are even around us, but they definitely are, and they're far more fluid than liquids are. So some properties of liquids that we're going to look at here. The first one is something called viscosity. And viscosity is the measure of the resistance of a liquid to flowing. So it's not how easily it flows, it's how hard it flows. If something's got a higher viscosity, it flows slower. So something like, you know, molasses or pancake syrup, especially pancake syrup that was in the refrigerator, that's got a high viscosity. And viscosity is influenced by a couple of things. It's influenced by intermolecular forces. So hydrogen bonds are going to tend to have a high viscosity and something with a dispersion force holding it together is going to have a very low viscosity. The shape of the particle, and as the next item says there, longer stringier molecules will get tangled together and flow slower, have a higher viscosity. Shorter, rounder molecules will tend to roll off each other and flow easier. And I think of this as being like uh, different types of spaghetti or pasta. If you have something like, uh, oh, what they call them, shells. Shells don't get tangled up with each other. If you try and pick just one shell out of your bowl, easy to do. But if you have spaghetti noodles, picking one noodle out, that's a lot harder because those are long and stringy and get tangled up. And then the last thing that affects it is temperature. And as you know, when you put pancake syrup in the fridge, it's much uh, thicker and more viscous than if you've just heated it up in the microwave and now it flows very easily. Just a quick note, year-round oils that you put in your vehicle actually change shape so that in the winter when it's cold and you want it to flow more easily, the shape is more like a sphere. And then in the summer, when it gets hot and you need more viscosity, you don't want your oil too runny so it's not protecting your engine, then it becomes a longer strand, which is pretty cool that they can actually make the oil change its shape rather than you having to change the oil. So properties of liquids, another one is surface tension. And surface tension is one of those words, kind of like pressure, that people use it, but they really don't know what it means. But surface tension is the tension on the surface of a liquid. How tight is the skin. Think of, think of the surface of the liquid as like being a cover on it or a skin on that liquid. How easily can you break through that skin? So um, you could tell by making drops with different liquids and looking at them from the side. And if you made droplets with water and rubbing alcohol, you would see that rubbing alcohol makes a really flat droplet. Water makes really round drops. So that's an indication to us that water has a much higher surface tension.
Now, if I told you that rubbing alcohol is nonpolar and water is uh, held together with a hydrogen bond, that would help explain why water is going to have a much higher surface tension than um, rubbing alcohol. A little bit more on how surface tension happens. It happens because the surface at the liquid have a greater downward pull than particles in the middle. So if you look at my diagram here, particles in the middle are being pulled in all directions. Okay, this is like having people all around you, you know, pulling on your two arms and your two legs and being stretched into four different directions. You're not going to go any one direction. You're just going to get stretched in all four directions. But particles on the surface have a few particles on the sides, but mostly particles below. So this is if you just had people pulling on your legs, but you could use your arms to try and pull yourself up and out of, you know, the mosh pit or whatever you're in. So surface particles have no particles above them pulling them up. They just have gravity and the particles below pulling them down. So it's going to tend to round the surface. And if I uh, scroll down here so you can see the rest of it. So this is what a water droplet down in the center looks like versus a water droplet at the surface. And that's what pulls it into this rounded shape is how it's surrounded by other particles and what force those other particles are exerting on it. A little more on surface tension is the greater the intermolecular forces usually means greater surface tension. So something like water with hydrogen bonds is going to have a very high surface tension, a very round drop. And in fact, this is why you can fill your glass with milk and you can make it bubble up and over the top a little bit without it spilling. I don't know if you do this when you're filling up the milk for, you know, a brother or sister, you deliberately get it way up to the top, and a little over the top so that they spill it. And then another just kind of interesting note about uh, surface tension is surfactants are something that actually lowers surface tension. And that's actually what water or what detergent does in water. It makes the water less attracted to itself and more fluid so it flows better um, across your dishes or through your jeans or whatever. Some people describe it as actually making water wetter, um, allowing it to break up from itself and do the cleaning that you want it to do. Okay, another property to talk about is something called capillary action. And capillary action is something you probably talked about in uh, biology. You may or may not remember it, so I'll see if I can jiggle your memory a bit. But normally, liquids like water flow with gravitational forces, so they're going to flow down. But sometimes, you actually see water flowing up against gravity. Like when you put a paper towel, uh, you know, to soak up some water or a sponge, water flows up. And that's kind of weird. I mean, that's not the way it should be flowing. That's capillary action. In order for capillary action to happen, there has to be some kind of narrow tube that can draw the water up. And it occurs because the substance, the sponge, the paper towel, whatever the substance is that's pulling the water up, has a stronger attraction or what we call adhesive force with water then water has to itself. Water's attraction to itself, its hydrogen bond, is known as a cohesive force. So cohesive coheres things, or you know, think about cooperating, keeping things together. Adhesive, you're familiar with adhesives like glue and adhesive tape, that holds different things together. So when there's a strong adhesive force between the sponge or the paper towel and the water, then it can actually draw it up. So this is water climbs up a tape, paper towel. It's also why liquids form a downward curve in a glass because it's there's actually such a strong attraction between the sides of the glass and the water that it holds it up there but in the center there's no glass there to hold it up. But if you put glass in different plastics you'll see very little curve in it but in glass you'll tend to see a fairly good curve or what we call a meniscus. It's also how trees get water up to the top. Okay think about it. Trees can get pretty dang tall, and the water has to get up there somehow. Rain does not put water into the top of the tree. Okay, the top of the tree gets wet, but it's not how it gets its nutrients. The nutrients get absorbed in the roots, and they have to climb all the way up to the top against gravity. That's capillary action. You remember, remember, you maybe remember words like xylem and phloem allows it to get up and get down. This is even how diapers keep babies dry after they tinkle. The capillary action wicks moisture away, and in fact, um, wicking materials have become very 
popular for clothing for us that if you're especially if you're working out and you perspire it helps whip that moisture away and the idea then is it takes it to the surface of your uh, jersey or whatever you're wearing where it can evaporate and leave you dry and cool and all that good stuff so those are some of the um, properties of liquids that make them different from gases that I wanted to talk about and then 12.3 also talks a bit about solids and solids are going to have some random motion but it's going to be confined to a much smaller space so it's really more like vibrating in place so as you're sitting in your desk or whatever and listening to this screencast you're going yeah right the particles in the solids around me are vibrating I know it's too small for you to notice but if we had a microscope good enough and we had eyes that were good enough we could see the vibration in there okay so in random motion with solids think of it as vibration and sometimes you can feel that vibration if you've ever been in like a balcony during a concert and people get you know swaying with the music and stuff you can actually feel it vibrating or on a bridge so yes there definitely is vibration or movement in solids so solids have a definite volume a definite shape because they're held in place the intermolecular forces they're so close together the intermolecular forces have taken over and are confining them to a set volume and a set shape so if we look at my uh, diagram below here's gases this isn't nearly the amount of space between them but I wanted to be able to fit it onto the screen lots of movement this is showing um, more freedom of movement liquids closer together they flow by each other and now solids are pulled very close together density is much greater and they're vibrating in shape so what are some unique properties for solids um, because of this well the attractive forces have a greater effect on the neighboring particles because they're so close together so this is what gives ionic solids and even metallic um, substances their rigidness well nonpolar solids can tend to be softer because the attractive forces aren't quite so great most solids are more dense in their liquids remember water's the big exception because it's got that hydrogen bond that actually pushes it apart but otherwise virtually any solid that's not water-based is going to be more dense as a solid than it was as a liquid and according to kinetic molecular theory you should remember solids have as much kinetic energy as room at room temperature as gases or liquids but they're not moving as much so how do they have as much energy well they tend to be more massive particles and if their mass is greater their volume will be less and when you multiply one half mass times volume squared you could come up with the same kinetic energy or the same temperature and those are some thoughts on liquids and solids